preach on this for a while, and I was just waiting for the right time. And as I was planning my sermons, I decided we're going to talk about Esther in the month. Hey, Esther, you're, we're going to talk about Esther in the month of October. <laughs> so this is the last Sunday in um, in uh, September. Hello, September. <laughs> and um, so I needed a, I needed something. I thought, well, this is this is good, especially following up on what Keith did last week. So turn in your Bibles or look on your apps on your phone or pull your pew Bible and look at Ephesians 6, 10 to 18. Ephesians 6, 10 to 18. whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand, therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. So that is our text for today, and it's a doozy. So, about six weeks ago, we were doing a study on angels and powers and, and supernatural uh, battles and, and what happens according to Scripture and uh, remember when I said nobody human dies and becomes an angel? You remember that, right? Because that was kind of my pet peeve. I see it all the time. Grandma got her angel wings. <laughs> Grandma won't get angel wings. It's a nice thought. But angels are created beings, and they do. They they are fighting spiritual battles. But we are fighting spiritual battles too. Now I just had a thought. Or a question. When you got up this morning, what went into your decision on what to wear? What went into your decision? Just call it out. What was clean? What was clean? <laughs> That's a big one. What else? The season. What season it is. Yeah, what else? Comfortable. Comfortable. Am I going to wear heels? Am I going to wear flats? Temperature. Temperature, yes. Long sleeves. Long sleeves. What am I going to do after church so that I'll be able to be comfortable? You know, we think a lot about what we're going to wear. And I think we sometimes put more thought into what we're physically going to wear than to what we spiritually put on. Is that a fair statement? I think it is. So this text is God's prescription or instruction for how to dress for success as a believer. So, I want you to notice a few things. In this passage, there are lots of active verbs. First, we see, be strong. Put on this and this and this, so that you'll be able to stand firm. Take up, be able to resist, stand firm. There's a lot of verbs there for things that we can do to spiritually dress for success. And so in verse 14, the first thing that is listed is put on the belt of truth. And I think you guys can see this pretty well. Um, one of these is a... It was, it was, on. was it? Uh, the belt of truth. There's like that guards the, the, the loin and the, and the belly area, your gut. The belt of truth. Now... When you think of a belt, you think of something that holds up your pants. Well, 
Roman uh, armor doesn't really have pants, so think of it as holding <laughs> up your spirit. <laughs> so, and, and, and covering that important part of that's so necessary for your living. Um, and this belt of truth is the first piece of armor because the truth is what our foundation is. And that truth is the gospel of Jesus Christ, that I have Christ in my life, he is my Lord and Savior, I am his child. That's the truth. That's the non-negotiable, okay? So when we get attacked, that, that is the, um, the crux of the issue. That's the, the truth that we can know, that belt, that we have a command center or uh, a center that is Jesus Christ. One of my, one of my lines is my non-negotiable is Jesus. There's a lot of Christians talking about a lot of things. My non-negotiable is Jesus Christ. Okay? Um, so Satan's primary weapon against the belt of truth is a lie that you're not saved or that Jesus isn't enough. And your answer to that is, yeah, the truth is I'm a child of God because I accepted Christ. First John says, or Romans 5, Romans 10, 9 and 10, if we confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God is raised from the dead, we shall be saved. It doesn't say I got to do this, this, and this. I got to be good. I got to, it just says if you confess and believe that Jesus is Lord. That's the crux of the issue, the belt of truth. Jesus said in 14, John 14, 6, I am the truth. And when we put on the armor of God and put on the belt of truth, we're putting on Christ. And really, we stand firm when we just say, I just quote 1 John 10, 9 and 10. What did Jesus do when he was attacked by Satan? He quoted scripture. So Jesus says, he prayed, I do not ask thee to take them out of the world, but to keep them from evil. How? Sanctify them in the truth. The word is truth. So the word, and then there's another word play in John that says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. The word was God. And it says the world comprehended him not. Who is the word in that John passage? It's Jesus. So it's all connected, okay? That's, that's, that's John the Baptist version of Christmas. That the Jesus came to the world and the world did not comprehend him. Okay? So the second piece of armor is the breastplate of righteousness. Right here. What does that cover? Heart. 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 It covers the heart, the emotional center of our very being. Now, many times when we have that experience where we commit our lives to Christ and, and we feel so good emotionally and a couple of weeks, maybe a month down the road, maybe the emotions have fled a little bit and we start to feel and to wonder well, I don't feel like I did a month ago. Am I still a Christian? Am I still saved? And then Satan, with his fiery darts, has an inroad to say, you're not. You're not worthy. You're, you're not worthy. You're a mess. Oh, you messed up. You, you just messed it up. You just sinned and you messed it up. So what is he attacking? He's attacking our emotional center. And anytime Satan can cause us to feel unlovable, unworthy, insecure, he is winning with those lies. But the truth, because of the belt of truth, is that our relationship with God is secure because it is done. Um, the cross did it. So I, I taught the kids last week about how you can be assured of your salvation because I remember... My parents got concerned with me because um, we, we, I grew up in a little church and, and it was often um, the case that 
uh, people went forward a lot to pray. And I remember as a young child, I was going forward. Every time I sinned and felt like I wasn't saved anymore, I was going forward. And my parents pulled me aside. They're like, Marie, is there something we should know? We should we worry? No, it was just a matter of this constant feeling of, I got to make sure, I got to make sure, I got to make sure. And so it was over the course of life that I learned that salvation is a gift and gifts aren't taken back by God. And there's nothing we can do to earn it, so there's nothing we can do to keep it. Okay? So so that breastplate of righteousness is, is what keeps us righteous. Well, how does it keep us righteous? I'm a messy sinner. The breastplate of righteousness represents, or to God, is like a film or it's like we're covered by Christ's blood and, and God doesn't see our sin anymore. It's as, it's as if it doesn't exist because we've been forgiven. And when you accept Christ, you're forgiven then and you're forgiven for future sins because it's going to happen, believe me. Okay? So, so that becomes a non-issue and you can just speak back to Satan one verse that I like to speak is greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So use those verses out loud, okay? Shoes of the gospel of peace. Okay. Shoes of the gospel of peace. Okay. So when you receive Christ, you and the Prince of Peace are united. First Colossians 3, 15 and 16 tells us to let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts and let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. Peace. When you get shoes, they are protection for your feet, but they're also, if you think about it, Something that will help you move, help you travel. It'd be awful hard to walk, especially in this day, without those sandals, wouldn't it? And if your feet are covered in the peace of Christ, then it suggests to me that wherever believers go, they are to take that peace with them. Sounds really easy until you get on Facebook. <laughs> Especially this week. I have, I'm proud of myself. I have not engaged. I have pulled back. I have said to myself, there's no convincing anybody on Facebook. I just am, I have only posted things that are uplifting and good and happy. If, if, if uh, there's a thing on, on Facebook right now in my, very, very close to my hometown, um, you guys know who Mike Rowe is? He goes around doing all those job things. And, <laughs> and, um, well, he went to uh, my, where I'm from, so, so poor. Oh, my goodness. And highlighted this very special woman who does a food pantry. I'll put it on my Facebook page if anybody wants to find it. But anyway, so I'm trying to put good things out into the universe. Because my feet have peace. I'm supposed to travel with peace, and it's really hard. But if there's anything our world needs now, oh my God, we can be that. Jesus, help us. We can be that. Um, it says, we have the promise that the God of peace, this is in Romans, will soon crush Satan under your feet. We can do that. We have the power. It says right here. Because Satan's really wanting to antagonize us, to, to engage in those arguments and those unwinnable verbal sparring. What was it you called it, Keith? You had a good phrase for what happens on Facebook. Um, thread wars. Thread wars. Yes, that is a really good description. So, but... And I, I, I'm going to, I could go on and on about the power of social media. There are some really good things about it. And, but, but there definitely is some opportunities to not be peaceful. So, so that's the, the, the shoe part of our armor. 
Next we have the shield of faith. Whoop, here I go again. Shield of faith. Oh. Let's see. Fix me. Fix me, Bill. <laughs> I don't know what I did. Thank you. Shield of faith. Okay. So the shield of faith in verse 16 is an accessory, and it's used to deflect things primarily. And verse 16 mentions fiery arrows. These are like temptations that come our way. If you want your shield of faith to grow large and protective, then your knowledge of God and his word must increase. Those flaming missiles from Satan are nothing more than smoldering lies, burning accusations, and fiery temptations bombarding us. We must use our shield of faith to ward off those fiery arrows. Just when we least expect it, one will come. These are temptations. If there's one thing I try to be with people in my life is authentic. I find myself in multiple situations where people get my food orders wrong in restaurants. It happened last night, and it happened this morning at Starbucks. My reaction last night was completely different from my reaction this morning. And when my reaction last night was ugly, I had to call back and apologize, actually. She got her order wrong, and I called back to apologize for being rude, because it's just not worth it for your crab rangoon. You know, it's just not worth it. But then I had to step back and say, okay, what am I really angry about? What is really going on? I've been at Kevin's funeral. I was sad. I was feeling like this world's not fair. By golly, why did you mess up my crab rangoon? I told I wanted. Have you ever just gotten one of those things in your mind where the thing that will help me right now is crab rangoon? And then when it wasn't in the bag, I was like, holy cow, <laughs> I need my crab rangoon. It's not worth it. Put that shield up, but don't allow yourself to be taken in by those fiery darts. That's a weakness for me, letting my mouth run. So when I got the wrong order I, at Starbucks this morning, I just ate it. <laughs> and I didn't go back and say, you messed up my order. There's a kind way to do that. I, I don't think that I'm saying you never go back and get it right, but just don't be ugly. So, so that fire, my fiery darts are going to be different from your fiery darts, okay? It, it's, it's whatever we have weakness in. That's... Uh, whatever our um, tendency is or, or uh, temptation, um, and it's going to be different. And for me, it's sometimes the same thing over and over and over. And I just pray for forgiveness, and I think, Lord, is there ever going to come a time in my life where I'm not struggling with this? He says, keep on keeping on. Get in the Word. Become more like me. Do you see a thread here or a trend that almost every one of these answers is about being in the Word? How does your ability to withstand those wiles of the devil compare to the amount of time you put in the Word? Interesting thought. Helmet of salvation, verse 17. In the metaphor, this secures our brain. Our our brain. Some of us, re I need a really secure brain. So the battle for our minds is either won or lost in the brain. And as we struggle with the world, the flesh, and the devil on a daily basis, we have to know that our salvation does not come and go with our success or failure in the spiritual battle and our eternal Eternity is not a matter of, of how good we are, that we are a child of God, Romans 8, and nothing can separate us from the love of God. So when we experience conflict,
conflict or doubt about our identity, if Satan could get us to think about how really um, unreasonable grace is, grace is not rational. Grace, forgiveness, constant love, undying love, amazing grace is not rational. So sometimes we have to override that rational part of our brain and just receive that grace. The sword of the spirit. Okay, I love this one. Oh, sword of the spirit. What is, what is the difference between the sword and all the other parts of the armor? Can anybody tell me? Sword of the It is the only offensive piece of the armor. Everything else is defensive. Wow. That's an interesting thought. The best defense is a strong offense. The word used here for sword of the spirit is rhema, R-H-E-M-A. And it means spoken word rather than the word of God as personified in L-O-G-O-S. So let's look at verse 17. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword and of the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So when you look at the Greek, when it says word right there, it changes it up to R-H-E-M-A instead of L-O-G-O-S. Why? Rima means the spoken word rather than the word of God as personified in Jesus. We are to defend ourselves against the evil one by speaking aloud God's truth. Why is it so important to speak God's word in addition to believing it and thinking it? Because, I've said this before, Satan is a created being and he doesn't perfectly know what you're thinking. By observing you, he can pretty well tell what you're thinking, just as any student of human behavior can. But he can, he cannot know what you're thinking because he can't get in your head. Because I believe once you're saved and the spirit is in your, your body and your mind, that, that it's, the spirit of evil cannot dwell there with it. They cannot mutually be in the same place. So if we want to attack Satan, we have to verbally speak it out loud. I don't know if you've ever heard anybody say that, but I believe it with all my heart that that's where we speak it out loud. That is our sword of the spirit. If you're going to re resist Satan, you must do outwardly so he can understand and be put to flight. Submit therefore to God, James tells us. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now, resist su suggests that it's an active, an active action. So you have to do something to get Satan to flee. I believe it's speaking out loud the word of God. God knows your thoughts and the intent of your heart, and Satan cannot eavesdrop on your time together. However, if you have been resisting Satan in your thoughts, he can't hear you. You must speak it out loud. Sometimes people might think you're a little crazy. That's okay. And I remember saying to somebody that the good news is that most attacks of Satan occur at night or when you're alone. So resisting Satan out loud will seldom result in you having to explain to other people what you're doing. <laughs> Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Another good one. It is written, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Satan, I believe, and the deal is done. Do you get it? Do you get the importance? Will you pray with me?